Well, I have started putting notes together and continued putting notes together and then thought for a little while and put some more notes together. And I ended up with seven pages, but don't worry. <laughs> I only plan on doing about six and a half of them. Um, I want to first let's address an issue because typically we do our Seder on Good Friday. Um, this year, the Passover doesn't come until April, what did I say, the 20, 23rd, 27th? 22nd. 22nd, it's in April. Uh, if you know me, you know I'm horrible with dates. You know, I'm, I'm lucky if I know where I'm going when I get in the car. So, um, let me just give you a little bit of background why the separation, okay? Um, originally, and throughout scripture, Easter was never a celebrated holiday by the Christian, by the Jews, okay? Um, approximately 200 AD, around there, um, Pope Victor uh, was confronted with an issue because part of the church had taken to celebrating the resurrection of our Lord in conjunction with Easter. And whatever the, the purpose is, I believe honestly, mostly they were uh, beneficent. I think they were benevolent. They were of goodwill. I think what happened is much like Christmas, the church looked at a day that pagans had taken and, and were celebrating to their false gods and said, no, this belongs to the one true God. And we're going to claim it back for him. Okay? And so they started celebrating the resurrection of our Lord on Easter. Now, Easter is an old uh, pagan holiday, probably comes from the Teutonic origins, it's celebrating the goddess Estore, okay, that's where we most likely get the name. Um, so when the church decided to incorporate this day and redirect it back to God, there arose a bit of a problem because about 200 uh, AD, the bishops of the eastern part of the church said, wait a minute, we, we've deviated from where scripture clearly says that the service was because it was in the Passover. And um, real quick quiz, did anybody know when the Passover is? What, what day did the Jews celebrate Passover? Anybody? What's that? 15th of Nisan. Thank you very much, Dennis. Okay, so we know that the, the persecution of our Lord had to come before the 15th of Nisan, okay? Now, what happened is because the way they celebrate Easter, it depends on the equinox and, and all of the things that come. The church tried to accommodate that while not losing too much footing with the former things, and they came up with this really convoluted way of determining when they were going to celebrate. And over time, that can lead to a separation of almost four weeks between when we celebrate the Lord's resurrection and when the Jews are celebrating Passover, which is when we know that he was in the tomb. So <clears throat> the Eastern bishops came and they said, hey, we got to reconcile this. And the bishop at the time, it was uh, his, or, uh, the uh, Pope at that time was Pope Victor. And he said, okay, the way we're going to settle this is we're going to do it the way we're doing it. And the Eastern bishop said, but that's not right. And he said, well, that's what we're doing. Now, fast forward a hundred and some years, we, we go to the Council of Nicaea, and Constantine tells the, ch the church, he says, hey, look, you've got the Eastern churches that are celebrating on one day, and you've got the Western churches that are celebrating on another day. We need to bring this thing together. So make up your minds, okay? And the, the opinion of the church was that it would be celebrated on Easter. Okay. This is why we're celebrating the Lord's resurrection today, and yet Passover isn't for another four weeks. Okay, So there's, there's the difference. Now, do I believe it was nefarious? No, I don't. I don't think so at all. I think that the church was doing exactly what Paul said to do. I think they went about it in a little strange way, but they were becoming all things to all men that they might win some for Christ. I think they just did that in the wrong case. I think they should have left the Lord's resurrection alone and said, hey, this is like Paul said, whether you celebrate the new moon feast 
or the Sabbath, whatever you're doing, do it unto God. So instead of trying to combine the two, they should have said, hey, we're not going to celebrate this to Easter anymore. We're going to celebrate this to God. So let's just have a day of celebration. They, they shouldn't have combined the two, but I don't think it was for nefarious purpose. And I, I tell you, I have read so many articles condemning um, the celebration of Easter and, and all of this. Look, what day is not proper to celebrate God? Okay? And if you're not celebrating God on this day, then it's probably because you're already in trouble. All right? So if that's the case, you've got a bigger issue than chocolate Easter bunny and colored Easter eggs. So let's get over this. All right? We're going to celebrate God today. We're going to celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ came as the Paschal Lamb. Uh, he came into Jerusalem Palm Sunday. He came in on the Lamb Selection Day, fulfilling the prophecy, the foreshadow of the Old Testament. This was the day where they chose the sacrificial lamb. And Jesus comes into Jerusalem that day. All right? And they're celebrating him and they're singing. And, and remember we talked last week, he wept bitterly. Okay? He was not celebrating. It was not a triumphal entry for Jesus. Because he was looking in the not too distant future and seeing a city beloved of God torn apart. And a people beloved of God murdered and, and, and enslaved. And the desolation of the country that God had chosen for that people for some 2,000 years. And he, he wept and he sobbed and he wailed coming in to Jerusalem. All right? Now we fast forward. Uh, Friday night we celebrated Good Friday. And it's kind of weird to say celebrate. But it's, it's actually very appropriate. Because on Friday, and, and uh, you know, I don't believe Jesus was crucified on a Friday. I, I don't think that's when it happened. But really, it doesn't matter. Because he was crucified. Okay, and I don't have to figure out the where's and the why for's because his word tells me that he went to the cross in my place. That the perfect spotless lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. So to understand this properly, you have to understand when the Godhead considered creating, he knew it was going to cost him the second part of the triune being, the Son. And He did it anyway. He chose to create us knowing all the stuff that was going to happen and what it was going to cost Him. Okay? Scripture tells us that when the time was right, when the time was right, Jesus turned and He set His face to Jerusalem. And He told His disciples, you know, we give the disciples a hard time because Jesus says, as plain as plain can be, I'm going to Jerusalem where I will be handed over to the heathens and they will persecute me and they will murder me and I'll be in the grave for three days and then I'm going to rise again. And they go to Jerusalem and he's handed over to the, the heathens and he's persecuted and he's scourged and he's crucified on a tree and the disciples went, what happened? <laughs> you would have done the same thing. All right? I'm just saying. I believe honestly that their eyes were blinded for a time because God did not want them getting hung up on the cross. He knew the cross was the way to eternal life. They had to go through the cross. Okay? Now, the disciples, they don't know what's going on. A day goes by, they're lost. Another day goes by, what are we going to do? Another day goes by and they're thinking, uh, when's our turn? I mean, they know we were with him. Then at daybreak, we have the, the Sabbath, the special Sabbath, the high Sabbath for Passover. And then we have the, the weekly Sabbath. And after the Sabbath was done, no work could be done on that day. They could not go and properly prepare Jesus for burial for the, the long term. And so that first day of the week, which we know was Sunday, okay, the women go to the tomb. And as they're walking down, you've got to wonder what's going through their minds. 
This is a man that they had followed for the majority of, their, of his ministry. They had seen him do the miraculous. Just a short time before, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. He had fed 5,000. He had fed 4,000 with just a little bit of fish and bread. He had cured the blind. He had raised the dead. He had healed the deaf. He had made the mute speak. And yet, here we go. This man that we have loved and followed and poured our lives into. And we're going to prepare him for eternity of death. And you got to wonder what's going through their minds as they come to the garden. And then they stop, and the stone is rolled away. Now, it wasn't just the 12 that Jesus told what was going to happen. Remember that it says the women were with him. This group of women were with him all throughout his ministry in Galilee. They went and looked after his needs, and they followed him to Jerusalem. They heard the words too. And they don't understand day three. <clears throat> day three. And so they come into the garden. The stone's been rolled away. Okay. Now I said before, the stone being rolled away, would you go ahead and put that up? Um, go to the second one, please. The stone being rolled away. When we were in Israel, we got to go to the place that is very likely, not definitely, but very likely, Jesus' tomb. We, we have a number of reasons why this place is, is most likely it. Just off um, toward Jerusalem, there is a hillside that has what, what is the look of a skull on it, where he probably would have been crucified. And then, remember it says they took him a short way away to the garden, they put him in a new tomb. Just a, a matter of about 70 yards maybe, 80 yards, there's a new tomb. And traditionally, when a Jew was buried in the tomb, they had the preparation room, which was in front, where they had a, a table that the, the corpse was laid on, and they would wrap it, and they would do the, the incense and the spices, and, and they'd wrap it up, and they would do preparation. And then they would move the body to a, one of a couple of spots in the back room, and they usually were front to back. And then they would take them in and they would lay them on a body. And then after a period of time, usually a year, give or take, the body would have decayed to the point that they would take the bones and put them in an ossuary, a box, a bone box. Okay? And then that box would be the final resting place of the bones. And the next body would be processed through that, that same system. But we know this tomb was never used before. But what's interesting is when Peter and John get the word, they moved him. We don't know where he's gone. He's not in the tomb. How would they know that? They looked. When they came running in, instead of looking forward, John looks to the right. This tomb was unique, not all alone. There were several other examples, but it was fairly unique in that instead of being front and back, it was left and right. And in the tomb, you can see... <coughs> Looking to the right, he would have had to look to the back table because the front table would not have been visible. There would have been a dividing wall uh, to, to keep the places separate. And you would not have been able to see the bed all the way to the right. So he would have looked to the, to the right and the back table would have been visible. That would have been this place right here. Now the table itself, the stone that he would have been laid on is gone. Okay? But that is possibly the place where Jesus lay. Not definitive, okay? But it suits all the criteria laid out in Scripture. So, they come, the stone, which by the way, this was not a big round rock. And, and probably wasn't even as big a rock as you would think. Because the doorways were small. Because if you had a small doorway, you could use a small rock. And you had to move the rock back and forth to get in and out. And there would be a stone trough which the stone would roll in. So it was probably shaped much like a stone wheel. Okay? Now, the, the uh, um, tomb that we went to, the doorway had been enlarged. So you could walk through with, you know, I, I just had to duck my head a little bit. TJ had to duck his head a lot. Um, but it had been enlarged. Now, off to the side of it was a stone 
round stone wheel. And it was only about yay tall. Now that probably wasn't the stone because it was quite a ways away, but heck, if an angel came and moved it, he could put it wherever he wanted. <laughs> I don't think that's going to be much of a problem. So they come, they look, he's gone. Okay? Now, all of a sudden, some of them are getting their eyes open. They, they run back. They get Peter and John, and Peter and John now. It's kind of funny because the scripture tells us that John ran ahead. You wonder, was he just a better runner than Peter? Or was Peter not real sure he wanted to go? Because you got to remember, the last encounter that Peter had with Jesus was when he had denied him. And scripture says that Jesus turned and looked at him. Okay? The third denial, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Okay? So part of you has to wonder, Peter's thinking, my life's already in an upheaval. I don't know how much more of this I can take. So they go. John stops at the door. Now, I, I love this because it so clearly illustrates Peter's personality. Peter just rushes right in. John, he stopped me. He's, you know, I'm, I'm going to check. Yeah, I don't see him. I don't see him in there. And Peter's like, get out of the way. I need to check. And he goes in. Now, Scripture tells us that the, the funeral clothes were off and then the the sheet that covered his face was folded. What a neat illustration. I don't know what the purpose is of that. I've heard a lot of things of what it might be. I don't think any of them accurately portray why when Jesus arose, he folded his face napkin. I don't know why he did that, but he folded it and laid it right where his head would have been. Um, that, to me, that's just cool that God would include that little bit in his word. Okay? So... <clears throat> They look, they go back. Do they believe? You know, honestly, you got to think that they're thinking the same thing that the Pharisees are thinking, right? Somebody took his body. Somebody, somebody done walked off with him. Great problem. Because they didn't believe that he had rose from the dead. Until what? They're behind locked doors. Because you've got to think, they're still worried about being arrested because of being one of the followers of Jesus. You know, you're one of the 12. Well, now 11. One's been taken care of. So you've got to think, they're a little worried. So they're behind locked doors, and then there in their midst, Jesus appears. I read the scripture. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, Jesus is... Our second Adam. He is the first fruits of the dead. He is the first one to rise, not just to come back from the dead, because he already raised people from the dead, but to be raised from the dead never to die again. There's a difference. Okay? He rose from the dead to an imperishable body that evidently, who needs doors? Okay? Now, I'm not... I'm not really into science as much as my kids are, but the kids read something or learned something in physics or one of those classes that I said, yeah, you know what, I'm going to take art. <laughs> you know, and they were talking about how physically it is possible for matter to pass through matter because the majority of the space that makes us up is space. So when you say you're spaced out, you really are. Because there's an enormous amount of space between the atoms that make up who you are. And it's a, it's a matter of being able to pass those atoms in between other atoms. Okay? So it is possible, we just don't know how to do it. But God does. And you got to wonder. God, you know, did God think, you know, about the physics of it when he did it? Or did he just did it? I think he just did it. I mean, he, he already knows everything there is to know. Why ponder on it? Just do it. You know? Um, when, when I do things that are by rote, I have a routine that I do things. I don't think about how I do things. I just do them. Taking off this, this rubber band. Those of you that are wondering what this is, I wore orange for a purpose today. Do you know why? I wanted us to remember today 
that there are a lot of people that are not able to celebrate the Lord's resurrection with the freedom that we do. Okay? They're celebrating in secret, in hiding. Okay? The persecuted church. That's what this is for. But I have a routine. When I take my, my bracelet off, okay, I pull it off like that. But when I put my bracelet on, I put it on like this. Every time. I don't think about it. I do it. Okay? Now, Jesus raised from the dead. Who's the first person he appeared to? Mary. Mary. I get really tired of people talking about the Bible and God as being sexist. Okay? If you read it and you understand what was going on at that time, Jesus was an incredible liberator of women. Okay? Paul was an incredible liberator of women. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't hustle off to see the twelve. He didn't hustle off to see the three. He didn't even hustle off to see the one. He appeared to Mary. Okay? And to me, that speaks volumes for God's heart toward women. And then he sends her. Now, what's interesting is, at this time, a woman was not even given credibility in a court of law. If you had a woman as a witness to something that happened and there was no man that witnessed it, the case was thrown out because she would not have been considered credible. Okay? And yet, Jesus makes Mary his first witness. The first witness to his resurrection is a woman. And he sends her to the disciples. And what happens? They don't believe. <coughs> I should have had a man with you, Mary. <laughs> what man was going to go to the tomb to prepare the body? That's women's work. We got to sit here and hide. <laughs> okay? So Mary goes and she tells them. And they don't believe. And Jesus shows up. You got to think. What went through their mind? Oh man, she was right. <laughs> Pete, I told you we should have listened to her. <laughs> you know, Thomas gets a hard time too. Because Thomas wasn't there when he, Jesus appeared the first time. He wasn't there. And then he comes and they say, Jesus is risen! And he goes, prove it. Let me put my finger in his, his side. And the holes in his arms. His feet. Prove it. Now, we give Peter, I'm sorry, we give Thomas a hard time. Doubting Thomas. Excuse me, it was doubting world. Alright? It was doubting world. Because... The ten that are yelling at him and hollering, Hey, he's a rose! A little while before, they were going, Yeah, right, Mary. And a little while before that, Mary's going, He's dead. He's gone. What am I going to do? So then Peter appear, or Jesus appears a second time. Hey, Thomas, come here. Put your hand on my side. Look at the holes. And Thomas says, and Jesus says, and I think this is something that is hugely important for us today. I have been stressing, and I will stress throughout the entire ministry that God gives me opportunity to, that we have got to be a people of faith. Okay? We have got to be a people of faith. We have got to be a people that believes that what God has said is true. What he has said he has done, he has done. What he has said he will do, he will do. Okay? Because Thomas looks at Jesus and says, I believe. And Jesus says... You believe because you have seen. But blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Okay? That's us. Okay? Now, I'm going to jump ahead. Now, we've, we've gotten the, the resurrection story. First fruits, the firstborn from among the dead. If you have your Bible, open to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. While you're turning there, I, I found an interesting um, thing that I want to share with you. Uh, did you know that Paul encourages us to celebrate the Passover? Did you know that it's in God's Word? Did anybody know that? If you knew that, put your hand up. Does anybody know where he told us? <clears throat> I'm going to tell you. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. You don't have to turn here. 
I'm going to read it. If you doubt me, you can turn here. Okay? I'm going to wait and see who turns. Okay. Uh, that, that's not true because I can't see you without my glasses. Um, verse 7. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. I have a niece that I love dearly, but she is so blonde. She is the blonde that all the blonde jokes were invented for. And we were driving one day, and she was talking about the, let's say, idiosyncrasies of my family. And she made a comment that inferred that I was like they are. And I said, hey, hey, don't lump me in with them. And she looked at me and said, Uncle Glenn, you're your own lump. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I am my own. So when I read this, this speaks directly to me. Okay? It says, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival. What festival? Passover. Passover. See, he just referred to Christ as our Passover lamb. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, to be honest with you, I believe that, that Paul is speaking much more than just celebrating Passover. But I think at its core, at its very foundation, that's something that he is reminding us this is a, a, a promise, a fulfillment of a promise that God has done. And it would do you well to remember it. Look at all throughout the Old Testament how many times they would put a, a mark. Does anybody know what the uh, festival of Purim is? Why, why they celebrate Purim? Esther. Esther. The casting of the pur, the pur. Okay? That was that whole festival they put in to remind them. Of, of what happened in the entire book of Esther and the, the almost decimation of the people in exile, the Israelites in exile, okay? So over and over again, God does one of two things that I have found consistently throughout Scripture to remind people. One is he says, let's put a celebration in place, okay? A feast. Something to remind us why we are here. Okay? Remind us of what brought us to this point. The other is to actually set some kind of a marker, an identifier. Okay? Remember when uh, they crossed through the Jordan River coming into the Promised Land, they had one man from each tribe gather up a stone and they set it as a marker. Why? So that they would be able to look at it and remember what happened and they could tell their children what happened. And when the descendants years off, generations later, looked at that, they would know why that was there and what God had done to bring them into the land. Okay, so in this case, if we celebrate Passover, we celebrate it not as the foreshadow of what is to come, but as the actuality of something that has already happened. Okay, see the Jews celebrate Passover looking back to their deliverance from Egypt, but we would celebrate it looking to our deliverance from sin. Okay, so let's, let's turn over to 15. <clears throat> Now, some of you might think, and, and honestly, I think the church does an absolutely horrible job in stressing the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, we know that the cross was enough, that his sacrifice was enough to cleanse us of sin. God did not need to raise Jesus up from the dead, but he did it, I believe, to prove a point. Okay? There is a before and there is an after. Jesus went to the cross in our place. That's interesting. Do you guys, have you ever heard the term, the crux of the matter? Do you ever wonder about that? <coughs> the crux means like the, the pivot, the significant point. But it actually comes from Latin for cross, which I think is incredibly significant because the cross is the pivotal point, the significant moment in history. Okay? So, at the cross, everything changed. Okay? And if it just changed unto death, then 
We would believe that our sins were forgiven, but what victory would we have in this life? And the hope that we hope for would be kind of like, not sure that you're going to get it. But when God raised Jesus up from the dead, and then he takes that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead and indwells it in us, ooh, all of a sudden the life that we have here takes on a new significance, doesn't it? All of a sudden, we're not just the people where we were before the cross, now we're forgiven, but we no longer really are us. We become a new creation. Okay? That's why baptism is so important. That is another symbolic thing to remind us. Okay? We are buried with him in death. We are resurrected into new life. All right? So, let's look at this. Why is the resurrection so important? Okay? I'm going to start in verse 1. Um, oops. Let me check my time. Because time is significant today. Well, it's significant every day. But today more so than <clears throat> tomorrow. Unless you have something important to do tomorrow. Okay, verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Paul was a great one for run-on sentences. <laughs> he would have confused me to listen to him talk, I think. Because he would have said this huge long sentence, and by the time we get to the end, I would have forgotten what we started with. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, in accordance with the scriptures. What scriptures is Paul referring to here? Old Testament. The Old Testament. The Hebrew Bible. Okay? That's the only scripture that they have at this time. The New Testament is being written, like right here. Okay? So, when he says, uh, raised on the third day, uh, died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, He's referring to, that. hey, guys, this is in the Bible that you have. <clears throat> okay? And he appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more, five, more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Okay? So Paul is is presenting his case for why you should put stock in what he says. Okay. Now, if you notice, there's a couple things here that, that Paul goes out of his way to stress. Do you notice the difference between disciples and apostles? Okay. We believe that there were 12 apostles, and actually it would have been 13 with capital A. Okay. There were the original 12 that Jesus called out from the disciples to be apostles. Now, apostle simply means someone who is sent. Okay. But there were 12 that Jesus specifically marked. One of whom was Judas, who betrayed him and fell. And then in the first part of Acts, we see that uh, Peter says, hey, you know, Scripture says that we've got, to, we've got to fill out our number again. So let us take into consideration some of, some of these things, some of these principles, and let's select someone to take Judas's place. Now, if you look in Galatians chapter 1, the very first thing that Paul says is that he is an apostle appointed not of man nor by man, but by God. Okay? He is putting himself on equal footing to the original 12. Okay? So, what I believe is happening here is Paul is differentiating between the disciples, the 12 that were called originally as capital A apostles. And then later he's talking about lowercase apostles, like we know Barnabas was. Okay? Those who were also sent out but didn't meet the requirements as having been selected by the Lord. Okay? But you notice here, he also says um, more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are alive, some of whom are asleep. Why does he say that? You know why he says that? Witnesses. Witnesses. Hey, look, you don't take me at my word? There's, there's 500 people out there you can talk to. Ask them. Dr. Simon Greenleaf was a professor of law. He was, uh, I don't want to say he was an atheist. He was not, he didn't believe in no God. He was more of an agnostic. I don't want to be bothered. 
right? And, uh, I'm happy where, where I am. And he was challenged by his students one day to kind of put on trial the resurrection of Christ. And so he went through the scriptures and he pulled out and he, he looked at some of the external references, uh, Josephus, uh, Herodotus, uh, some of those writings, and, and he, he looked at these things and he came to a life-changing conviction. Jesus had to have risen from the dead. And not only did he base it off of this passage of scripture because of all of the witnesses that attested to this fact. Can you imagine if we had a court case today where there were 500 witnesses that all saw the same thing? How do you think the jury would find? But the other thing, the thing that he said really, really convinced him is that before Jesus' crucifixion, the disciples... You know, they, they stumbled. When Jesus went to the cross, they scattered. They were lost. They had no idea what to do. But when Jesus rose again, and he came and talked to them, they walked away changed men. Because every one of those men was martyred. Now, even John, who died a natural death, they tried to kill him, and God said no. They tried to scald him to death in boiling oil. The dip method. And they dipped him, and God pulled him back out and said, no, it's not your time. So they said, well, he won't die. Let's send him to Patmos. Let's just get him out of our hair. Okay? So every one of them suffered intense persecution, and they refused to recant. Now, if you did not believe something to the depth of your soul, could you get 12 people that didn't believe something to the depth of their soul that could suffer that and not change their story? And not only did they die for what they believed, that they rejoiced doing it. We are considered worthy to suffer. As a matter of fact, when they take Peter, tradition tells us they did not crucify him because he said, I'm not worthy to die in the same manner that our Lord did. So they flipped him upside down. Okay? Can you imagine? What do you do with a witness that refuses to change their story regardless of the persecution they face? Regardless of the personal attack, the, the vitriolic things that you spew at them, the torture that they suffered, the ways that they died, and yet they rejoiced knowing that in that moment they were going to be reunited with the Lord that they knew came back from the dead. So, I'm going to skip forward just a little bit. <clears throat> um... Verse 12, I'm going to pick up verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Um, you know, the, I, I don't know. You know, there may be people in here that, that don't believe that somebody can be raised from the dead. Okay? I, personally, I have never seen somebody raised from the dead. I have seen people that I knew were bound to, to die, and God brought them back. But I've never seen anyone that was officially pronounced dead and was raised back to life. I think of uh, Shea Cordell. She should have died. Matter of fact, they were telling the family, be prepared because she's going to die. There's nothing we can do. And God said, no, it's not your time yet. Okay? So, um, so Paul is dealing with this issue, the resurrection of the dead. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Okay, so there were some that are, are expositing that Christ was raised from the dead. Yeah, but he was God. We're not going to be raised from the dead because we're just man. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true the dead are not raised. He would have made an incredible lawyer, wouldn't he? <laughs> For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people are to be most pitied. 
Okay? See, the cross was sufficient to take away our sins, but if the resurrection didn't happen, our faith is vain. And we are to be pitied of all people. See, our hope is not in something that might be. It's in something that will be. Our hope is when, not if. He is risen. I'll say it again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. That should take on new many meaning to you today. If he has in fact been risen from the dead, we also will be raised from the dead. That we might be like him. As a matter of fact, our perishable bodies will put on the imperishable. We will be like him. Now, don't get me wrong. We're not going to become gods. We're going to become something a whole lot better than this. I wonder if there are going to be bald people in heaven. <laughs> I think God has a soft place in his heart for bald people. I really do. You remember Elisha? The kids come out of the town. Oh, baldy! Elisha's got a bald head. And God said, okay, that's enough. And the bears came out of the woods and ate the kids. <laughs> so parents, I warn you well. Teach your kids. God loves baldies. <laughs> Father, we bless you this morning. And I thank you, God, that we can stand convinced absolutely that Christ has been raised from the dead. God, we bless you. Father, that you looked down through eternity and you saw our desperate need for a Savior. You saw the need for reconciliation, that we had wandered away from you, that we had offended you, and we had fallen. And you put into play a plan of salvation. You created something that had never been created before, 100% God and 100% man who came as a spotless lamb, a lamb led to slaughter in our place. And that blood that covers us, that precious blood that wipes away our sin, that, Father, we can stand before you completely righteous, absolutely sin-free. And I thank you, Father, that he came the first time as a lamb, but when he comes again, he is coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he is coming to claim his own. And he is coming to put aright all that has been made wrong. And I thank you, Father, that we have this great hope. Father, this faith that what you have said you have done, you have done, and what you have said you will do, you will do. And we bless you this morning and we thank you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.